Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome back. So, uh, in the last lecture, we had been talking about uh, cantilever-based biosensors, and I focused primarily on dynamic, um, uh, dynamic biosensing. That once the biomolecule lands, the natural resonant frequency of the cantilever changes. And uh, today, I, I'll tell a, say a few thing, few more things about the cantilever uh, dynamic biosensors, but then move on to static biosensing, where the deflection occurs. But we are not relying on the oscillation, but rather the degree of deflection uh, associated with the cantilever. And we'll see in the next lecture that how the static deflection uh, can be have very large sensitivity, much larger than you might expect from potentiometric or amperometric sensors. So this is sort of in that sense a preparatory lecture for the next one. Uh, let me tell you one or two more things about dynamic biosensing before you leave this topic. And then I will move into static biosensing. Uh, I will immediately first emphasize that static biosensing on its own, own doesn't work. You cannot measure through static biosensing alone uh, the mass of a bacteria. You always need dynamic biosensing and I will explain why. But under specific circumstances, if you design the device in a particular way, you will be able to measure it under uh, static biosensing also. And that has to do with nonlinear biosensing. I'll explain how, how that works before I conclude. Okay. So you remember the sp special feature of the reversal of frequency at the nanoscale. This is a very important thing to remember that uh, generally we always have expected that as the biomolecules sort of, uh, you know, gradually build up, uh, then the resonant frequency should go down, should gradually go down. And you see that happens, especially at very low thicknesses, uh, as the biomolecules are building up in the early part, it does go down as one would expect. But uh, what happens that as more and more biomolecule uh, sort of land on the sensor surface, it makes it stiff, just like starching your shard makes things stiff. And so therefore what happens, it begins to compensate the mass effect. And at some point what you will see that because this compensation is so perfectly balanced uh, that you will not see any shift in the resonant frequency, even after the biomolecule has, uh, has landed on the sensor surface. And of course, if you allow it a longer period of time, the shift in the frequency will actually become positive. And I ex explained to you the critical frequency and how to, how to calculate it. Uh, so this is an important consideration at nanoscale biosensing and that does not happen at a millimeter scale or uh, even at micro micrometers thickness uh, membranes. All right. Now, one thing I wanted to emphasize that although I have focused on the peak, the resonant frequency, uh, you must have noticed by now that this is not a delta function at a omega naught, but rather the red curve is broadened and so is the blue curve. And this broadening and the peak position is actually not given by the simple formula uh, that, that I told you about. This simple formula where the omega naught is simply proportional to k divided by m under square root, that's really not everything in the story. Remember, I neglected the, 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 the response or uh, the damping, as, the damping associated with this and the damping in the fluid is of course very different. Uh, from the damping uh, in air and it turns out that can have an important effect and that is the reason why uh, the, this broadening, broadening occurs, right. And this is a very important thing, especially when you are looking at the experimental data, that when the damping is present, the gamma is present, uh, even if you don't have any constant external force, so you, so you give it a ping, allow it to oscillate, but depending on whether it's oscillating in water, which is high gamma, or in air, which is low gamma, uh, 
the response would be considerably different. And it turns out that you can solve this equation instead of just having e to the power i omega naught t by a more damped oscillation with the sine omega prime t. This is the new resonant frequency, the omega prime. And it turns out that uh, the solution, and it will be given in the appendix, uh, that you can check in the appendix, uh, it turns out that the omega naught, the new uh, resonant frequency, is km divided by k divided by m square root, that's fine, but shifted by this gamma squared by 4m squared. So if your uh, damping is significant, so you can see the resonance frequency will be significantly affected and it will be shifted at a lower frequency. So one must account for this damping when you want to know what is your original omega naught and how far it has shifted from the original position. By the way, the gamma with respect to the omega naught, original frequency omega naught, undamped, uh, is related to the quality factor, Q. And so therefore, you'll often hear that high quality factor is very important in order for accurate uh, cantilever-based biosensing. All right, so that's all I had to say about uh, dynamic biosensing. Look at the appendix in order to, in order to uh, see how this derivation works. But that's essentially the basic story about a nanoscale dynamic sensing with a nanoscale cantilever. Now let's talk about uh, uh, mass-based sensing, challenges of mass-based static sensing. Now, you see, dynamic biosensing requires that you monitor the frequency and monitor the deflection of a laser beam on a photodetector array. Uh, that generally requires an AC circuit and others. So, therefore, it would have been much better if we could just bend it, you know, just like a person standing on a diving board at the very end. If the person is uh, heavy, then the bending will be more. If the person is light, the bending will be less. If we could just measure the bending in a static mode, life would have been much, much, much nicer. But it turns out that it's difficult. Let me explain why. So assume that uh, in this top figure, the, bio, the biomolecules are yet to arrive on the sensor surface and captured by this magenta probe molecules. And this is a simple silicon nitride cantilever, micro cantilever, and could be very thin. And once the biomolecule arrives uh, because of the mass, also because of the electrostatic push or repulsion, or because of the hydration, or simply because the biomolecules are large, pushing against each other, the whole cantilever, whole cantilever might, uh, might bend. It's just like bimetallic uh, strips. When you increase the temperature, the whole thing bends because of the surface stress. The physics is no different. Now, it could be because of the mass, surface stress, or the change in the spring constant. The whole thing may deflect in steady state. The question is, can you measure it? Let's see. So, let's calculate. We are thinking about steady state. So, life is good. I don't have any acceleration. I don't have any damping. Only thing that I have is the force is being balanced by the spring. What is the force? Well, force is mg. g is a gravitational constant. All right. So life is simple. So you can take this quantity. That's the balance force. Now you can take log on both sides. So log k plus log y is log m plus log g and take a differential. So that makes you delta k over y, k naught, delta y over y naught and so on and so forth. You remember, you see that there's no term called delta G over G naught because, of course, this hopefully the, uh, the gravitational constant doesn't change significantly when you have changed things by a nanometer. So that uh, is not there. And so, therefore, the net change is equal to how the mass changed due to mass and changed due to spring. Mass is trying to make it heavier. Mass is trying to make it bigger or lengthen the total spring and the spring is sort of pushing back. And the net difference gives you the net shift in delta y. All right, so that's that's simple. By the way, you may remember that in the resonant frequency also, we had this spring competition between spring constant and the mass. And so this is essentially, the reason is, that essentially they have come from the same physics, I'll explain in a second. 
All right, so this looks like a good strategy. So let's take an example. Let's say you have a silicon beam again, about a uh, length is five micron, width 1.5 micron, very thin, density is silicon, so therefore 2300 grams. And let's say you have some protein molecules, this prostate specific antigen, right? Marker for prostate cancer. That comes in, lands on the sensor surface, coats it on the, uh, on the cantilever. Again, I'm assuming it's about coats the whole thing uniformly, length five micron, width about 1.5 uh, mic, uh, I'm sorry, these would be micron, both of them are micron, H is about 50, 50 nanometer, and the density is somewhat less dense, so uh, about a thousand kilograms per uh, millimeter, uh, meter cube. Let's put it in the previous equation, change in the delta m over m, and once you calculate it, you see the deflection is huge. Whatever was the original, uh, original deflection is about 100% increase in the, in the deflection. So you'd be very happy that this is going to be a very good sensor. Uh, except that once you calculate the Y itself, that how much deflection has occurred, you'll see about 40 femtometer, which is very small. There's nothing. Uh, there's no technique that allows you to measure uh, a distance that small. And since it is unmeasurable, therefore, even with great sensitivity, this is a technique that we cannot use. So somehow, if you could reduce the K, if we could somehow reduce the K spring constant, of course, we could increase it. Now we want to reduce it by quite a bit, right? Because you see 0 0.0152, which is already small in the nanoscale, that didn't do it. So we may have to reduce it by a factor of 100 or 1000 before we can, we can actually measure something. And so therefore, somehow we have to soften the spring. Now, how are you going to soften the spring? This is already small silicon cantilever hanging there. How do you soften the spring? So this is a something that I'm going to discuss uh, in a little bit later. Before I do so, let me tell you why is it that we could measure things in dynamic oscillation, measure mass, there is no problem. But when you try to do it in static, we said that, oh, it's too small. Why is that? It turns out that, uh, it turns out that for the dynamic case, which was the last lecture, you remember why was a e to the power i omega t or in the real uh, function a cosine omega t. So if you get the acceleration, you'll have omega square multiplied by a, a is the amplitude of the oscillation. Now, do you remember what the omega was? The omega that we calculated was couple of gigahertz. And so by the time and the oscillation was about a nanometer. When you multiply these things, you see, you can see that we were oscillating at about 20,000 G. So actually, we were artificially sort of making the acceleration significantly larger. That allowed us to make the measurement there successfully. But with a G alone, the static deflection, just with a single G, we cannot measure anything. So that's why uh, this dynamic sensor worked but the static sensor does not work. We have to do something about it. So let's start by doing something about the static sensor. And the trick would be the following. We'll add a capacitor. Remember previously it was just a spring, cantilever, electrical things were not around sort of. Now we add a capacitor. So the capacitor has two plates. One is a bottom plate and the top plate would be this cantilever beam and we'll apply a voltage. And let's see how the property of the sensor changes as a result. What it will do effectively, it will change the K, reduce the K significantly. That's what's going to happen. So again, you will have the force balance equation exactly the same as before, you know, you have the acceleration term, damping term, and the spring term, equal to the external force, any force that you apply, and then, because I have used a capacitor, there will be an electrical force associated with it, we say with the capacitor. Now, in steady state, of course, the time-dependent terms are zero. 
the first and second term are zero. So I have just spring, external force and the electrical force. How do you calculate the electrical force in a capacitor? Again, from the college level physics courses, you have no, may have noticed this, that the energy of a capacitor is half CV squared. Everybody knows that. Now, how do you get force from the energy? You take a derivative. Derivative with the energy with respect to the change in the position. That's the force. So if you take a derivative, it will be half V squared dc dy. By the way, the negative sign comes from the fact that the y is measured vertically down. That's why. And the V squared is a constant because here look at this battery. That battery is always connected at a constant voltage. So voltage is not changing. But once the cantilever has come down a little bit, the gap has changed. And so therefore the C has changed, the capacitance has changed. And so DC dy. If it were a parallel plate capacitor, what is the formula for parallel plate capacitor? Epsilon naught A over Y. And so DC dy simply will be epsilon naught A over Y square. So you can put it in, you can immediately get the capacitor, the force associated uh, with this additional capacitor. Now, let's think about a person who does not know that you have added a capacitor. He is still thinking that it is the same old spring mass system shown here in B. What I want to tell you that that person will think that the spring has the effective spring constant K effective, which is different from the physical K that you have because we have added this extra capacitor. You know, this person doesn't know that there is this capacitor business going on in here. So this is the effective spring constant. And let me tell you how that spring constant becomes very, very small once you put a capacitor like this. All right. So remember, in equilibrium, the spring constant is being directly balanced by, the spring force is directly being balanced by the electrostatic force associated with the capacitor. And you remember why, why this 1 over y square? Because dc dy in a parallel plate configuration had this 1 over y square. All right. Now you see, for somebody who is in the B configuration, the person may think that he had the original spring and there is some extra force uh, that is coming from the from this capacitor, which he really doesn't know about. For him, he sees the total external force. And essentially, is the sum of these two. And if you do that, then the corresponding spring constant, corresponding spring constant, that would be this df over dy. And the spring constant will be, of course, the k, that's fine with a negative sign, that's fine, but there will be a y cube dependence in here because there is a y square here. And first of all, the spring now looks weaker, considerably weaker. This was the original k minus this quantity. And the higher the v, weaker the spring. And in fact, you can make the v so large that the spring constant may disappear completely. In that case, remember, I'll have a huge change in once I biomolecule comes in, there'll be huge deflection because I have effectively made the spring constant disappear. Now, this particular expression, 2v squared, you can rewrite it by using the first expression here. This is how it works. So, v squared epsilon a over 2y squared, so you can essentially take this quantity, put it in here, and then you will immediately see that will give you 2, two third k y naught minus y. And once you sort of put it in, you will get the final expression. So what does it mean? It says that as soon as you keep increasing the bias, the voltage V, the effective spring constant will gradually go down. And eventually when it's 2 third y naught, at that point, the spring constant will essentially vanish and the spring would have uh, softened considerably.
Now, what's this special about this two-third why not? Well, in order to understand it, you have to understand that this spring mass system in the presence of a capacitor is a highly nonlinear system. It is such that if you apply a voltage, the spring will come down, oscillate, and then stabilize. Put a little bit more voltage, it comes down, oscillates, and stops. But if you put beyond a certain voltage, as you get closer to this two-third Y naught, it can then snap shut beyond this point. So it becomes highly nonlinear capacitor in this system. And if you do an sort of uh, a simulation, you will see that for one voltage, the black line is sort of oscillates and stabilizes at a given distance. Y naught is about, let's say, three micron. And little bit more voltage, red stabilizes, blue stabilizes, but apply a little bit more voltage and it doesn't stabilize at all. And so we are talking about biasing the sensor in the blue curve, close to the blue curve, where the sensitivity is the greatest. So how does it work? Why, why is there a transition like that at two third, why not? In order to do that, understand that, you have to plot the Y, the displacement, as a function of the force. Remember the spring force goes as K Y naught minus Y, which is the red line. As you pull the spring more and more away from Y naught, the force you require increases linearly. So therefore you will have, of course you cannot go below Y naught because the two plates will be together. So that's the maximum point. It increases linearly with spring, with spring constant. Now what happens because of the electrostatic force goes as one over y squared. So in the beginning, the spring force is significantly larger than the electrostatic force. So nothing much happens. So this is, by the way, this y squared comes because of the fact, as I have told you before, dc dy will have a y squared dependence. That's why the f electric, this electric force has a one over y squared dependence. So it stabilizes as a particular point. The spring constant has reduced a little bit, but not significantly. Now, if you increase the voltage a little bit more, then you can see the difference between the electrostatic and the spring has narrowed considerably. So the spring is getting weaker. And at one point, essentially, they will be tangential to each other. And this electrical force will be always larger, this blue line, will be always larger than the red and the spring will not be able to hold it back. It will snap. And so we want to operate very close to this point because at this point, the spring is the weakest. Any small perturbation change causes a significant change uh, in the displacement. So you can find out what this position is simply by noting that at this position, at this critical position, we have to be a little bit below that. The forces are equal, the tangents are equal, and if you equate these two, and you will do it as a part of the homework, you will find that two-third why not, the spring is the weakest, and at that point, you actually have the greatest sensitivity. Now, you can look at it in a slightly different way also, in terms of total energy. This is the spring energy, K Y naught minus Y squared divided by 2. Electrical energy is half CV squared. If you don't have any voltage, then essentially the rate curve, the electrical force has no, no effect. As you increase the voltage, then you have the pink and the green curve. And if you put them together, you will see that in the beginning, you have the total system is, has equilibrium at Y naught. As you apply more and more voltage, the spring gets weaker because that's the curvature gives you the spring constant. Look, the curvature is the second derivative of this with respect to y. That gives me the spring constant. The curvature becomes small. And at some point, at the green curve, essentially there is no stable point. It goes and clamps shut. So we want to operate close to the weakened spring position. And that is something I'll explain in detail in the next lecture that how we can use this spring weakening or spring, spring softening in order to have highly sensitive cantilever based biosensor. So let me conclude then. Uh, 
So I told you about the importance of dynamic biosensing, but I, the last lecture we simplified things a little bit. I explained the frequency reversal and all, but didn't really emphasize the importance of damping, fluid damping and broadening and quality factor. I pointed this out uh, this time around. In fact, this is why uh, it's difficult to go below a picogram in fluid because of the damping issue. Uh, in fact, if you didn't have damping, if you had in vacuum, uh, hundreds of, uh, on the order of 100 zeptogram is easily measurable. And so therefore, this is an important thing. Damping is very important. It's not a second order effect, especially at nanoscale. Now, I explained to you pure mass-based sensing is difficult to measure. Why? Because the gravitational constant is so weak. You know, for us, it's very strong. We, we can walk around. We stay attached to the earth. That's not a problem. But think about a little virus or a bacteria. They don't care about that they are about uh, the gravitational constant. In their lives, gravitation plays no role whatsoever. So in that case, either one has to do this dynamic biosensing, which makes the acceleration thousands of times larger or have to weaken the spring in such a way so that even a small mass can, can cause significant deflection. And one of the ways of spring softening, you know, you can always have a new material that you can try to find, very difficult, is to simply add a capacitor. And if you add a capacitor for the biomolecule sitting on the cantilever surface, you know, biomolecule doesn't know that there is a, you have added a capacitor underneath. It doesn't know that. It feels like the overall spring has weakened somehow. And when it's landing on it, the deflection is significant. And that is the physics I explained in the last uh, three or four slides. It turns out that physics of this transition, abrupt transition, spring weakening, is at the at the heart of this phase transition, how water becomes solid and the solid uh, ice and ice becomes water. This phase transition and this physics are equivalent. And the great sensitivity you have at the phase transition is exactly what we are using here to measure the mass of a virus or a bacteria. So that's it. Let me end here in the next, next class. I will, or in the next lecture, I will show how the static bio deflection and transistor based sensing can be combined together to greatly enhance sensitivity. These are nonlinear biosensing. Uh, but until that point, uh, take care.